Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Gould and welcome back to the studio for another fabulous tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the DSLR camera. I'm going to try to move through it fairly quickly, but those of you that have watched my previous tutorials know that I try to give you as much information that I, as I can, but that tends to mean the video is quite long. So uh, if you need to stop and start the video, please feel free to do that. But I have lots to cover today. So this will be a fairly basic uh, once over with the camera. The way you're going to learn how to use a camera is to do and try things take a photo course, take the photojournalism course, and get involved. Just this video, this tutorial in no way replaces some of the other uh, courses that we offer here at Ryerson or courses that you can get somewhere else. Because what I'm going to go through is just how does the camera work? That doesn't mean you can take great photographs. One of the things that I spend a lot of time in other uh, workshops talking about are some of the background rules, the principles and elements of design, how to use colors, angles, textures, all of these things that are important. How to do low light photography, high speed photography. Not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm just going to show you how to get started, how to get your feet wet with this fabulous little tool. So refer to other material, take another course. This is just a little taster. It's like we're at the grocery store and you're going to try one cracker and then you have to buy the box to get the whole thing. If I have a choice, I'm going to take a smaller camera bag. When I buy camera bags, I buy just enough for the camera to go in and then I put this inside another bag. I find that safer. Uh, first of all, make sure you get a strap and second of all, make sure that the strap is securely to the camera. So do check and make sure is it on properly and put it around your neck so that it's always secure even if you're just um, doing some basic functions with it. So let's get right to the camera. So a DSLR, what does it stand for? Digital Single Lens Reflex. One lens, it's a digital recording device in the back and it is a reflex camera. Now what does a reflex camera mean? If I take off the lens and show you here, you will see inside there's a little mirror deep inside there you can sort of see it right in there and the mirror what it does is it takes the image that's coming through the lens and bounces it into your eye like a periscope up it goes and then back out so when i look through the camera eyepiece i'm actually seeing what is coming through the lens of the camera uh, which is great because it shows me exactness for framing the problem though is that I won't know what the actual exposure and stuff looks like till I take the photograph. What we're getting used to in today's culture, I think, are what smartphones do is when you look at the picture and you hold up the screen, it shows you before you even take the photograph if it's too dark or too bright. So the technology is moving that way in this form as well. For years, the DSLR has been the top of the heap, but recently there's a new contender with new technology. It's called a mirrorless camera. And what the mirrorless camera does is it does away with the mirror inside and where the mirror is is just the sensor and so when I look through the, through the actual eyepiece I'm actually seeing an electronic screen just like you're at the back of your smartphone so when I look at a picture it's showing me exactly the exposure that I'm going to get and what the picture will look like before I take it. There's lots of advantages to that technology. One of the other advantages besides just how practical it is is the camera is actually physically smaller a lot of them so they can put them in a much smaller body so that's very very good. There's a little button right here on the side that's what I pushed right there to release the lens uh, and then if you look here you'll see there's a, a square right there on, um, and also on the lens see how there's a square right there okay uh, just match them up and turn do you hear the click clickety click just like that so now that now it's secure so to release it I'm gonna uh, push this button here and then turn it out and Click it in like that. I will tell you this too, not all camera lenses have the square on it um, and there's some of them have a red dot and so there's a red dot in this camera as well. If you look right there, there's a red circle. So just be very careful because um, you can damage the lens of the camera by not putting it on securely, okay? It's an 18 to 55 millimeter uh, zoom. So it is a zoom control. So. I can go from a wide angle, which is 18, and then I can zoom it all the way to 55. There's a little thing called a diopter adjustment right here. What that does is that focuses the eyepiece for your particular eye. I have two batteries here. Uh, what I do before I take any equipment out is I circle check my stuff. I'm going to make sure, first of all, that both batteries are charged up and working, so I'll put them both in the camera. So what I, what I do here is on the back, there's a little, the, the battery compartment is here. I just open it like this and it locks in place and then I'm going to close up the, um, uh, the bottom. Uh, on the side of the camera right here is where the, the uh, 
the card slot goes, or the SD card. Again, we talked about this in another video, but the card that you need is a faster card, a class 10 is good or faster. The faster the card, the faster it'll transfer um, files and information, which is great for so many reasons, but uh, the camera only has a certain uh, buffer size. In other words, it'll only hold so many pictures in the memory before it needs to dump them to the card. So if your card can do it faster, that's always better. I'm going to put it in here like this, and it pushes in like that. And to release it, I just push it the opposite way, and it bounces out, and then I close it. Now, the thing with the Canon cameras is when the camera is on here, um, you always want to make sure that when you put your card in and out of the camera, you have the camera off. Uh, because if the card is writing uh, to the camera in some ways, it could damage the card. But with this one, there's a safety feature. If I open the door, uh, you see how it shuts off the camera. So if I open the, the SD card door, it shuts the camera off, and then when I put it back, it then um, puts the camera back, turns the camera back on. So the camera has the battery in it. I'm going to turn on the power. It's right here. I just push it to the on position, and it turns on. Now, uh, this is for the photos. If I want to do video with the T5i, there's another switch that goes further up, and you, if you look, it looks like a little... See if I can turn around so you can see it better. So here's the on off, but the third position in the top part is for a digital, see that looks like a movie camera. So if I click it up there, the camera then goes into movie mode and the screen goes uh, to f always on because now it's working like your smartphone or a digital video camera. Uh, it is now actually in the video mode. Uh, and while I'm talking about that, the record button is right here. See the little red, little red dot there? If I push that, the camera will record. And if I stop it, I push, or to stop it, I push it again. One of the drawbacks with the DSLRs for video is the most you can record at one time is 12 minutes per clip, right? So record, let's say I'm recording a wedding or I'm a, a conference, after 12 minutes, the camera will stop recording. The file size is as large as it will get. So there's a, there, that's a disadvantage. Again, the, the other problem is battery issues because then you're burning up the battery quite a bit because it leaves the screen on the whole time, which then just keeps eating the battery. So be careful of that. So if you're shooting video, not only would I recommend one extra battery, I would recommend several extra batteries. Uh, okay, so the DSLR, <clears throat> we're not going to talk a lot too much about video. I will only say this, record here. Uh, if you're using it for video, there is a microphone jack on the side over here. So behind this door here. There is a microphone jack here. It's a mini plug. It's the one on the bottom. Um, and you plug into the, this hole on the bottom. So you need a special cord uh, to get an audio cable. So you go mini jack to an XLR, and then you can use it with a, uh, a hand mic or a lav mic. Um, also, DSLRs sometimes will mount a, uh, sometimes people will mount a, um, a shotgun mic or a, a directional microphone into uh, the hot shoe. This is what they call the hot shoe, this silver thing here. And, uh, and then get the sound that way. The audio on these cameras is not great. Part of the problem too is that there's so much noise from just moving things and your hands right here. The, the, the built-in microphone will pick up on that and it will, to my mind, ruin your, your, um, your video. So uh, do be careful of that. So if you are shooting video with it, again, uh, it's got a nice look to it, a nice warm film look, um, partly because of the type of sensor that it uses. Uh, different reasons, but um, there, the, it is highly recommended you plug an external microphone into the camera and you do that here with the mini jack, but you do need the uh, cord, the mini cord to the XLR. If you ask at the DL, uh, in the equipment distribution center, they will set you up with what you need. Um, now, the problem is uh, the headphones. There's no headphone jack on this level of camera, uh, which is a problem because if I have a microphone up, hooked up incorrectly, uh, I may have shot the whole thing and the video is completely worthless because um, there's no sound to it. So if you're using a DSLR, we do recommend that you take an external device, even if you use your smartphone or uh, some kind of a Zoom recorder or a digital audio recorder to actually record the sound separately, I think you'll be well advised to do that. Uh, there is a, um, a VU volume unit meter built in. So there is a built-in VU meter in this camera, but if you're looking for it, you're not going to find it unless the camera is in the right mode. So right now the camera is in the auto, the A plus mode right here, the green mode. You're not going to see that too well, I don't think. 
Uh, but the auto plus mode does not allow, it basically does auto everything. So it gives you no options to override anything. So in order to find the VU meter, I need to move it to a different mode. Let's try the program mode, the P mode. So it still does auto everything for me. But now uh, when I go into the menu settings and I go over, I can then actually find the VU meter. So when I put the camera in the program mode, the P mode on the top, and I go to the menu, I now have an option to look at the C. It's a sound recording. If I use these buttons right here, this is my up and down button, I can then see a VU meter and it's showing me a volume level of the sound. Now that doesn't mean it's good sound quality, it just shows me the sound volume, how loud it is. So you do need to be careful and any pro level application really needs headphones uh, in order to assure that the sound quality is excellent because the sound quality on my microphone is good here, but if I uh, move it away and talk further away from it, the sound quality is not very good, but the VU meter on the soundboard is still doing just fine. So I have to make sure that I record the sound at a good quality, not just quantity. So um, right here I see the VU meter is bouncing around, but again, this is only showing me that the camera is actually getting some kind of sound. If you look to the sound recording is set to automatic, which is what I would recommend if you are using this for video. Um, but what I would suggest too, if you want, you can go into manual and then I can actually manually adjust the record level, right? So I can go up or down. Uh, this is very hard to do upside down. There we go. So uh, I can adjust it up or down on this particular camera and uh, I can manually set the volume control on the camera. So uh, the camera does have uh, some audio capabilities, uh, which we like, but again, leave it in um, automatic. The way the, the Canon cameras work is pretty straightforward. There's a menu button right here, okay, right here. So the menu button, what it does is it brings up all the different options. It just brings it on and turns it off. Uh, but this set of buttons over here, this circle button with, see how there's uh, four, four buttons with a middle button? These are my arrow buttons here, and even though they don't have an arrow on them, but I can uh, um, go through the, the, the menu this way, and then to go down, I just go up and down with the top and buttons. You see the big block there that's going up and down as well? And then to adjust something, I push the middle. So what size do we want to record for video? Now the video record size is 1920 by 1080. See that right there? And it says 30 frames per second. What does that mean? There's 30 individual frames. That's what we use here in North America for television and video. So I've selected that. So do make sure that the camera is set to full resolution 1920 by 1080. Before I go any further, let me just talk quickly about the, uh, the screen and the menu options. Uh, this particular camera is a touch screen, so you can touch it. If the screen is not responsive, there's a little cue in the, the corner right here. If I touch the cue, that gives me then uh, touch abilities. The reason you can turn it on and off the touch screen is if your face is touching it, it can be a problem, and Canon has recognized that. So do make sure you're aware that the cue turns it into touch screen, and when it's not, it'll actually reset, and you just saw it do that. Um, but one of the options you can do too besides using the touch screen is you can use the, the buttons that come with the camera. There's a menu button right here and that's your friend. So if you push that, all kinds of internal options come up. So again, the options will change depending on what mode you're in. When I'm in manual mode and I push the menu button, there's fewer options along the top. If I go into program mode, now program mode is basically auto everything, but I can override anything that I want. Automatic is it does everything for you and you can't change anything. When I push the menu button here as well, I get far more um, uh, choices. So when I push that button, all kinds of options come up. And one of the first ones that come up there, see how it says image quality? So this is for photographs, the, the L with the, the wedge there beside it. That means large quality, and then you always want to shoot large quality. So if I just touch screen there, these are all the options. There is one option down here, raw plus the L are the large size pictures. So this camera is an 18 megapixel camera. When you use the L with the, with, the, with the wedge beside it, it's shooting full 18 megapixels. So this is an 18 megapixel camera. You can see the size of file is going to be there in, in pixels. And then 974 photographs is what I'm going to take out of that camera. The other option that you might want sometimes is raw plus large. And when I select that one, you see I go down to 210 photographs. Uh, the picture size is the same, but what it does is RAW is an uncompressed file, so it records an uncompressed file and a JPEG. So this camera, when it's shooting, is shooting in a JPEG, um, which is a compressed image. 
Uh, typically, JPEG is fine for a lot of what you're doing. Most of what you're doing, it's fine. Uh, the problem with RAW is not everything will open RAW, and uh, you can get into trouble if you're trying to view things on a device. So um, if you're going to shoot RAW, I highly recommend you shoot RAW plus a large file. And this card isn't particularly large, but I do have 218 pictures. Um, but if you're going to shoot it like that, you might get yourself an extra card or a larger card. But for, uh, for most uh, applications, I just pick the, the large image here, right there. So the, the full wedge, you see how the wedge gets smaller, but it's the full quarter circle there. And that's what I want to pick for my image quality. So that's for my photographs. And I just say, push the button here. Or I can also use, again, these buttons right here. Uh, are work like arrows and I'm going to actually use those here because I think it'll be easier for you to see. So if I click over uh, here I can also see the movie size uh, right there okay and this camera is going to be shooting at 1920 by 1080 that's the size that I want for full HD it does not shoot 4k um, and then there's other options along the bottom if you're shooting for the web but again I highly recommend always shoot the highest and best quality that you can because you can always make it smaller later but you can never make it larger so uh, do be careful of that and then again you can touch either the set button down here or I could see how there's a set button right here on my finger I can just push it that way I personally find the the hard buttons easier especially when I'm using my thumb on the camera uh, but it's a certainly shooter's choice. Uh, so that's set for video. We're ready to go. And then again, too, if I go through the menu options, uh, when it's in program mode, not in, not in automatic, um, I will see the um, audio options, which are here somewhere. And here we go here. So, uh, so besides showing me the size of the video that I'm going to be shooting, 1920 by 1080, see how sound recording is set to automatic? Uh, that's a good thing for this camera, especially since there's no headphone jack and you can't actually monitor the sound. But if I go down and uh, click on that, I actually see there's a VU meter. So this is showing me the volume level uh, of the sound that this camera is picking up. The record, the microphones are on the top right there. Uh, the sound recording isn't great on these cameras because there's so much noise. Even when you're turning to zoom in and out on the camera, it, it will, the, the microphones will pick it up or any kind of movement. So highly recommended with this camera is that you, um, you get an external microphone. The microphone plugs into the side over here. Uh, it's the front one. Uh, and you can see it's a mini jack. So you're going to plug into that. It's the, the one on the bottom by my thumb down here. That's your microphone. The top one is not a headphone jack, and nor is the bottom one. But there's no way of actually monitoring the sound with the way the camera comes native. Uh, so the um, audio recording down here, the sound recording, uh, the VU meter does show us that uh, there is sound being picked up. But just remember, just because the volume meter is moving doesn't mean the sound quality is any good. It could be total crap. And the placement of the microphone is everything. Even this microphone, if I take it and move it further away from myself and talk over here, the sound quality changes. But the VU meter is still showing me a good level. So be very, very careful with that with this particular camera. So you can see that the volume meter is picking up uh, and showing you sound. Uh, I can also see where it says auto. I can actually go into the manual mode here too. Um, and I can then actually adjust the volume accordingly. If it's, <clears throat> if it's too loud, I can then make it quieter. So this little camera for video is very good. The quality of picture is very nice. Nice warm color, looks really great. Very, very popular. Uh, I find the limitation is the zoom. I find it hard to zoom in and out. Um, and then the audio limitations are also a problem for me because there's no headphone jack for me to listen to the quality of sound. If it's working, it's great. Again, mini jack to XLR, or you can mount a shotgun mic onto the top of the camera to imp uh, improve the quality of sound um, for, your, uh, for your camera. Again, the, the, you have to put it in camera mode here, all the way to the, um, uh, to the camera. And then anything you turn on the dial here will impact the way it records video. So be very careful what mode you have it set in. Again, uh, the program mode allows you to override things and it does show you the VU meter. The auto everything mode does not. So that's where that is. All right, so let's switch it down to the camera mode right here. I'm just going to push it to the on position and then that makes it a, turns it into a, a still camera. And again, this wheel right here, this has all my different functions on it. And this is where I can set it to manual mode, um, et cetera. And I'll talk about that. The, the goal as a photographer professionally is to shoot in manual 
uh, to know what, you know what different things affect the camera. There's three things that affect the exposure of the camera. The shutter speed of the camera, the aperture of the camera, and the ISO. The ISO is how sensitive is the camera to light. The ISO button for the, um, the, the, the Canon camera is right here, ISO. So if I push that, the ISO buttons come up. And again, this is a touch screen, so I can change it by touching it. Uh, eh, hard to do it upside down. Uh, or by pushing the ISO button, I can then uh, turn the wheel on my thumb, right? And that will change it as well. There's lots of options for the ISO, and basically it's how sensitive your camera is to light. Now, you might say, well, why don't I just make it really sensitive to light? The problem is if it's too sensitive to light, the way that it does it electronically is it also then makes the picture grainier so that it looks like sand in your photograph. It doesn't make your picture nice and sharp. Modern cameras are very good though, so we find that you can actually do quite a bit with the ISO before you start to notice a quality, uh, picture quality loss. Um, automatic is just, it sets it for you. There's nothing wrong with that when you're learning, but uh, let me just run through it. 100 and 200, those ISOs are, they need a lot of light. So if you're in bright sunlight outside, it's in the studio with these lights on my face, uh, professionally lit uh, situations, you can get away with 100 or 200. Again, nice, sharp, crisp pictures, uh, very low grain on the picture. Um, 400, uh, also fine outside. Uh, it allows me a bit more um, latitude if I'm doing higher speed photography, I'm on a boat, I'm shooting sporting events, that kind of stuff. It, it gives me a bit more um, room to, to use other options with my shutter speed. Same thing with 800. Um, these are all out, uh, good outside um, bright daylight type ISOs. Uh, then you get to 1600. 1600 is fine inside right, uh, and uh, actually quite good, 32 and up to 6400 inside on these cameras would be fine. But again, do a little test, take some pictures at each one, like at each level and look at the picture and then zoom in on it and you'll see that um, they're, uh, the 100 ISO pictures are actually crisper than something shot with an ISO of 6400. However, if the shot is, you have to shoot with a higher ISO to get the proper exposure, then you do that because you want to get the picture if something is too dark. Um, if you're going to shoot any, any way, either overexposed or underexposed, go underexposed because there's more detail in the shot. If a shot is overexposed, all the detail is blown out. For example, on my jacket, again, the collar is overexposed. I just like the jacket, so that's why I wear it. Plus, it makes me look, well, PhD, right? Um, you can see on my jacket where it's overexposed on the collar, right? The detail, like especially on this collar, see how the detail is lost? So there's crinkles in the jacket. You can't see it because it's overexposed. If this was underexposed, there, you can put some of that, put some of that detail back in. Uh, you can increase the brightness a little bit, and it's the detail still in the picture. So if you have a choice between over and underexposing, underexpose it because you'll have more um, image detail. So on the on the side of the lens, you're going to see a little button that says autofocus AF and MF right here. Uh, autofocus is pretty good. It's actually very good, and the more expensive cameras are even better. The problem with autofocus, though, is it'll only take a picture when it's focused, right? If it doesn't focus, it doesn't take the picture. Uh, and that's a problem, especially if you're doing an event, somebody's coming out of a court, it's very quick, you only have a second or two and you, got to get, you have to take the pictures. So when you're on photo assignment, uh, recommend manual focus. Again, see the MF, and then you focus, the focusing ring is here. And the thing with that is every time I push the picture, it will always take the photograph. Whereas if I'm in autofocus, See, that's a problem. So be careful of that. Um, but again, for most of what you're doing, the autofocus is probably fine. But if you're in an event where time matters, that's what you want to do. And, and play around with it. Get to know the camera. So um, auto manual focus. There's also a stability button right there. See, it says on and off. Uh, leave it on. It's a minimal uh, help, but it's better than nothing uh, to give, uh, take away some of the shake on the camera. Um, and you're good that way. So uh, ISO is number one. The second thing that affects the exposure of your camera is the shutter speed. Again, these are not in any order, but the shutter speed is how fast the, the camera actually takes the photograph. If I take the lens off, I can actually illustrate that to you. If you look here, you'll see the mirror. If I have a slow shutter speed, you see how the mirror has lifted up and it's exposing. You can see there's an electronic sensor back there that's actually picking up and taking the photograph. So the faster the shutter speed, if I change the shutter speed and make it faster, see how it's faster? 
and I can shoot even faster than that. So the faster I go, less light comes in. You see that when the shutters open uh, or when the, um, the, the sensor is exposed to the light for a longer period of time, more light burns in on it. So if you're in a low light situation where you're doing a long exposure, let's say you want a city at night, you can change your shutter speed and make it really slow. So the faster the shutter speed, the faster the, uh, the camera will expose the, um, the sensor behind, less light will come in, which means that it's grabbing the action. So if I'm throwing a baseball, it'll capture that action, but less lights come in and the camera has to compensate for the less amount of light coming in. And again, one of the ways it does that is with the ISO. By going with a higher ISO, it makes it more sensitive to light so that the light that does hit the, the imaging sensor is recorded um, and gives us the proper exposure. So does that make sense? ISO, how sensitive the camera is to light. Shutter speed, how fast the shutter opens and closes and how much light comes into the camera. So let me actually show you how to set up the shutter speed. Uh, when you're in the manual mode on the camera, uh, you can adjust the shutter speed again on the back. So this camera is in manual mode, so I see the M over here. It's the shutter speed here is 1 15th of a second. This is my f-stop or my aperture. We'll talk about that in a minute. And this is my ISO. So my ISO is set for 6400 and um, manual. So I have full control of the camera. I'm also shooting large JPEGs and I have 923 pictures. You can also slow the camera down really low. Uh, this is three, there's four seconds, five, six, seven seconds. So if I'm shooting a city at night, I'm shooting out my window, I want the traffic and I want the kind of the lights blur, uh, I can use a slower shutter speed and I can try that. Um, remember too, you have to be careful of your ISO because if your ISO is set to the wrong area, it's either gonna be really overexposed or underexposed. So you need to play with your ISO to find the balance between a long exposure and a nice, um, uh, sensitivity to, the, to light. Another thing you can use the, a slow shutter speed for is maybe water, you know, it's got that silky look. If you have a longer exposure, then the camera will record all the water and it's moving uh, and give you a nice sort of soft, silky uh, shot looking of, of like the river. So it's gonna be, uh, that's an effect that, uh, that, that can look really great. One of the things that you learn about photojournalism is uh, you are not allowed to Photoshop very much after the fact. So if there's something in the shot in the background, you can't Photoshop it out. If there's something, um, you know, a person, a hand, you just can't do that. Um, you can't add motion blur later. You can't add, certainly not for a newspaper if you're doing a, um, uh, if you're trying to sell in a picture. All the, uh, the imaging has to be done with the camera so you can do in-camera effects. I can do blur and motion and that kind of stuff but they all have to be done with the camera. So it's, it's good to know these sort of things. The other thing too is if I'm shooting say with one-tenth of a second um, and this again is why you want to take um, a camera a course is and you can learn how to do panning and get like a motion blur so that the person is either the person's blurred or they're in focus and the background is blurred. So there's lots that you can do actually with the camera. You also saw the bulb effect. Um, there was a bulb setting and what bulb is is when it's on bulb, if I push the, the, the camera, it'll, it, it will stay open until I let go of the, um, of, the sh of, the sh of the shutter button. Here's a quick side note, a drop in. Uh, if I want to do, if I'm in shutter speed priority and I want to do a night shot, and I want to do a long shot, say I want to do a 30 second shot of the sky or a night scene, I'm trying to get stars. If I just push, the, put it up like this and push the button, when I push the button, the camera's going to move and that's going to ruin the shot because the shutter's going to open up, it's going to blur and the whole thing will be, be no good. So there's, there are different drive modes. When I'm in single shot, when I push the button down, it's going to take one picture. This one here is multiple mode. So if I go over to that, this is called continuous shutting. When I hold the button, the shutter button down, click, 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 click. It's going to take them as long as I'm holding the button down. Great for sports and other scene uh, type of um, need where you need more than one picture quickly. You then have the self timer. There's a 10 second timer if you want to be in the picture, the original selfie mode. Um, and there's also a two second self timer. I really like the two second self timer and that's what I use for long exposure. So I'm going to select two second self timer right like this. I've got it on a 30 second exposure. I'm going <clears> to <throat> aim it up at the sky and then I'm going to push the button and then I'm going to let it go. It's going to count to two and now I'm not anywhere near it. It's exposing the sky, uh, the stars and everything and my camera is not being moved. Does that make sense? Because when you push the button, if I knock it a little bit, that's enough to blur the whole picture and you have to be careful of that. So that's in manual mode. What I'm going to recommend though is when you're learning, start with the program mode. 
Uh, program mode is a great place to start. You can then override other things if you want. You can override your shutter speed. You can also override your aperture. Um, or there's another mode here called TV mode. Uh, TV mode is not actually television. TV stands for time value. Uh, that's Canon's way of saying it's the shutter speed priority. So how fast the shutter is taking the picture, that's your TV mode. Um, so when it's in TV mode, I determine the shutter speed and the camera does everything else. Um, well, let's see, in this particular case, I've got the ISO set to 200, but if you wanted to, I could put the ISO to automatic and then the camera does auto ISO and aperture will also be in automatic. One of the things that I'm noticing as well, and you can't see it, but see this line right here? There's, this is um, the EV exposure value. And if you look really closely, you'll see that the, there's a bar under the number five. And so what this allows you to do, this allows you to make some minor exp um, exposure uh, changes, either a little, little brighter, a little darker. Um, and so somebody has set this all the way, uh, uh, that's on plus five. So let's, it should be set to zero. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna push this button, the AV button here, I'm gonna turn the wheel, and that will then put that little marker back in the middle. Does that make sense? So sometimes if you're taking a picture and it looks really overexposed or underexposed, it's because this is set wrong. The other thing you're gonna watch for is this little button here, or it's actually, a, see how it's a, a light bulb? If you touch that, I can actually change this uh, to different things, cloudy, um, daylight, uh, auto. What I found is the auto white balance is very good. So I would suggest leaving it on auto white balance. You can also custom, see how there's this button right here. This is a full manual white balance like you do with a video camera. Uh, you hold up a white piece of paper, you push the set button right here, but uh, don't fiddle around with that, especially when you're learning, right? There's no sense doing that. Let's just put this back to, to auto, auto white balance. Okay, so that should say AWB. Again, this should be L with the, with the wedge of cheese beside it and the ISO set to auto, but you can, again, you can adjust that, and you should adjust that manually, but just for what I'm showing you here. So in time value mode, TV mode, the camera is, you have control of the shutter. The third thing that the camera needs to uh, control uh, proper exposure is something called the aperture, and that's how much light does the lens let through to the imaging device in the back of the camera. So the shutter controls the light coming through the lens, but the lens itself determines how big a hole, how much light is actually going to come through the lens, and that's called the aperture. Now there's different ways to set the aperture. The aperture when you're in full manual mode, it, uh, it's right here, f5.0 is the aperture. Uh, there's also the, uh, an, a mode on these cameras called the AV mode, the aperture value, and what the aperture value is, when I turn the wheel now, it's not the shutter speed, I'm actually adjusting, and you can see it right here, I'm adjusting the aperture, uh, a bigger number or smaller number. Now, what I found hard when I was learning photography is get to get my mind around that. The bigger the number, see that's at F32, <clears throat> the bigger the number, the smaller the hole. Eek, small. The smaller the number, the bigger the hole, right? So um, maybe you can figure it like there's more coverage, there's 32, and there's smaller coverage, there's five. Does that make sense? So the more you have, the smaller the hole, and the vice versa. So um, you can determine how much light comes in with, with the aperture as well. Uh, by the way, the reason this keeps cutting out is because there's a sensor built into the eyepiece. So if you hold the camera up to your face, the, the actual viewfinder turns off. And I should also say while I am thinking about it, the viewfinder is also reversible. So you can switch out the, uh, the viewfinder. And this is great if you're taking a photograph above your head. Okay, or down low, so you can adjust it, and it's great for video, or I can show people when I'm taking pictures, or if I'm doing video, what they look like. But that's a side note. So there you go. So now back to our regularly scheduled program. There's different ways of adjusting your aperture. Uh, one of the ways, is, of course, is in manual, and then just adjust it uh, on the back. Uh, or if, when you're learning, a good way to learn aperture and how it works is to go to the AV mode, aperture value. And when you go into the aperture value mode, you will notice that the turn wheel, uh, the wheel here now controls not the shutter speed, but it controls your aperture right there. 
9, etc. But the aperture there it determines how much uh, light the lens is letting through, but it also plays with the depth of field. What is the depth of field? Another way I describe it is your depth of focus. What's the range of focus? If you have something that has a deep depth of field like this shot, you're going to see way behind me that brick wall is in focus. Everything is in focus. That's a really deep depth of field. Part of that is because I'm shooting fairly wide. If you shoot with a wider lens, say the 18, it's going to give you a deep depth of field. As you zoom the lens in, the depth of field gets shallower. The other thing that affects the depth of field is the aperture. So the smaller the hole, more is in focus. The bigger the hole, less is in focus, more shallow fo uh, focus. So if you want to take a photograph of me and blur the background, then you need to back the camera up, zoom the lens in, and go with a very, very uh, a wide open aperture, say 3.5 or 5.6, whatever the, the camera is set to, right? So whatever the aperture is going to be all the way open, that's going to give you the most shallow depth of field. Why does that matter? Why do you need to know these sort of things? Because when you're taking a picture, and if I have, say, five people in a row, and I want them all in focus, then I need to make sure that the aperture is going to work for me so that they're all in focus. If I have it set to a very shallow depth of field because I have it, the aperture all the way open to, say, what's this, at 6.3? Right, so it's all the way open at 5.6, um, and I've zoomed in, there's a good chance that only a couple of them will be in focus and the other ones will be blurred. These are effects that you can use to your advantage. They do work really great. It works great in sports, too. You've seen it all the time. Just take a look online. Somebody's you know, jumping for the net, and the background is all, so all blurry and soft. That's not a Photoshop effect. That's an in-camera thing that they've done. Again, because in photojournalism, there's very, very little that we can do in Photoshop. Um, we're not, everything needs to be in camera. So those three things, aperture, shutter speed, and your ISO, all affect the exposure of your camera. Zoom lens is here, right? I'm zooming in and out. Uh, I can turn the camera on and off here like this. I've got my fold out screen. Again, I'm taking a picture at a concert. I'm going low with this camera. I'm using it for video. All of these things are very, very helpful. Uh, to take the picture here, again, the button's right here. When I'm doing video, the button is at the back right here. And this button is also the live view mode. If I push that button, it's going to turn the, the, see how you can now see through it? So then this is a photograph in photo mode. So if I'm going to take a picture, it probably won't take it because it's an autofocus. Um, but I put it to manual focus and it will. So I'm going to take a photograph, right? It's going to take it because it's blurry, but um, that's, uh, that's live view mode. Again, that's going to burn up your battery real quick, which is another reason why we bring a, where is it, second battery. So always bring a second battery with you. Uh, most cameras have lens caps. Please do use them. Guard that lens, and um, you are good to go. So that's just a, just a primer. That's just to get your feet wet in photography. Uh, maybe, if nothing else, when you watch this, you think, Boy, that's way more complicated than I thought. I should take that photo course, and you absolutely should, because you'll, you'll learn at the photo course, you're going to learn all kinds of tips and uh, other things you can do with it. Camera on, pick a mode, okay? Uh, if you're learning, uh, again, I recommend the program mode, because you can override things. One of the things we didn't talk about is the flash. The flash on and off button is here on the side, right with my finger. So if I want the flash, I push it, and it goes on or I can close it up. When it's in program mode, I determine if the flash is going to go off or not. If it's in automatic mode, the A plus mode, when I go to take a picture, it's automatic. I can't actually, it's just going to do it. It's just going to, it's just going to do it. So um, a lot of times I don't want the flash. You did see earlier there's a, there's a no flash mode I can put it into, flash off, but again, it's like automatic but no flash. There's a whole bunch of other modes in here too. You can select the portrait mode. There's one for far away macro photography. They'll see the little flower for close-ups, that kind of stuff. Um, again, the goal is really to work towards manual photography. But here's the thing. If you're taking great pictures, personally, I mean, I don't really care what the settings are like on the camera. If you understand um, the basic uh, principles, how to do a good, uh, take a good photograph. But I think what you will find is the more control you have over the camera, the more creative control you have over your photographs, and it gives you a bit more range. So that's one of the reasons we love the manual. Uh, but I know people that shoot, you know, aperture value or aperture priority is uh, what we call it. Oops. Uh, where the camera, I determine, the, the, you know, the depth of field. I'm just telling, okay, I want a deep depth of field, so I'm going to shoot with an f22. I want it to be really shallow and really blurry in the background. I'm going to try f56. Um, uh, or if you're shooting sports, you know, maybe you want to try shutter speed and, and try the time value mode and then use the, 
use a higher shutter speed that way, force the camera to a higher shutter speed and then make it uh, like even 500. Depends on what you're shooting. If you're shooting racing or whatever, uh, um, you're gonna find that um, you might go with a faster than that, but uh, people running aren't that fast. Um, and if you go with a, sh a slower shutter speed too, you can then do some of these blur effects where you're actually taking a photograph where it blurs the, blurs the image um, behind the person but the person's actually in focus. There's lots of stuff you can do with the camera. It's a lot of fun. Photography is great. I don't care if you're using your smartphone or the DSLR or the new mirrorless, which I love. Um, but the, the, the advantage is this. Learn how to take a picture with this and then you can transfer those skills to the other modes. One of the big advantages that these cameras have over a smartphone device is you have an optical zoom lens. So I can zoom it in like a telescope or a pair of binoculars and the quality is maintained as I zoom in and out of the camera. So there you go, that's the, uh, the DSLR primer, the Canon T5i. Uh, believe me, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more that we can talk about. ISO, how sensitive the camera is to light. Shutter speed, how fast is it taking pictures and what's it doing to the action? Do I need to capture the action or do I want it to be blurred? Do I want a night scene? Do I want the moon at night? I'm shooting this thing on the eclipse. Shutter speed and then aperture, what kind of depth of field do I want in that? Well, I want the moon at night. Um, but if I go with too small of a, um, an aperture because I want everything in focus, it'll affect these other things. So think of it as a triangle, right? Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, and those three work together. So if you have more of one, you have to compensate uh, with the other two to make sure that the exposure is right. And again, as I said, if you have to pick between overexposed and underexposed, go with um, underexposed. So there you go, that's uh, digital photography in a nutshell. A tough one to do for me because I've been doing this for over 30 years. I love photography and have so much more to say. So I'm gonna end it there. If you want to know more, do more reading, take a, take a photojournalism course, uh, look stuff up, watch more videos. Um, this is not meant to be an ad for Canon, by the way. We like all the manufacturers and they all the cameras work very similarly. The most important thing though is you understand aperture, shutter speed, and um, and ISO, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Those three things work together to give you a properly exposed photograph, and it also affects the way the picture looks. So if you understand those things, you're halfway there. Uh, all those other things we talk about in terms of elements and principles, design, colors, backgrounds, framing, that kind of stuff, that is uh, another video for another day. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, I'm Dr. Gary Gould, and I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>